welcome. I am delighted that you're all here today. Thank you, this gorgeous day. Blue sky. That blue sky makes us feel good. The intensity of light feels different today. The sun's intensity. Spring is coming. Can you feel it? It's pretty great. So what we're going to talk about today ties right into that coming of spring. Um, it's very exciting. It's very exciting for me, somewhere deep in my soul. Right? So page 51 today, and you can put your feet flat on the floor. Take a good deep breath or two. And I'd like to, while you're breathing, or breathing intentionally in this moment, I'd like you to concentrate on a favorite plant. Could be an indoor plant, an outdoor plant, a large one or a small one, a tree, or some flowers, an African violet maybe. So I'd like you to concentrate on that favorite plant. Kind of imagine yourself being with it. Thinking about its structure from its roots under the dirt to its above ground growth. And then imagine yourself, envision yourself breathing with this living being. Really being with your favorite plant. In your mind, smile at it, marvel about it, and then think in Lakesh. In Lakesh, that plant is another you. So it might seem like an odd transition, you know, from birth and death on Monday to plants today, but is it odd really? considering that the nutrient cycle, the air cycle, the water cycle, everything that we do depends on plants. Quite interconnected we are. This is, uh, this is not working. This is now going to work. There we go. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible light that we see is this really narrow band right here. So all of these are wet waves, right? Y, wa y rays, X rays, UV, um, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, long radio waves. So increasing in wavelength as we go that direction. Uh, so. What we see is this very narrow band of, of light. So from about 400 to 700 nanometers, and I just said increasing in speed, it's actually increasing in speed this way, um, because violet are the fastest wavelengths that we can see, and red is the slowest. Uh, so, as you look at that spectrum, this visible spectrum, right here is the green. You can see the green is very long, um, not as long as red, but green is, is long in here. Lots of different shades of red, or excuse me, of green. So what's happening in our eyes is that they're sorting out the cones and the rods are two parts of our eyes. The cones are what helps us to see color. Each primary color resembles or matches up to these wavelengths. And right there in the central range of our spectrum is where our perception is best. We can see more shades of green than other colors. Um, because our eyes have evolved over time. Color perception is highly determined by our evolution. So if you imagine the surroundings of our ancestors long, long ago, you can envision large regions full of luscious green forests. Maybe some of you have traveled here in Pennsylvania. We have some luscious green forest here. 
if you've traveled to someplace tropical, the colors of green even vary more there. It's our belief that our ancestors could see the color green better and because they had an advantage of seeing what food plants are available. Identifying and recognizing food sources. So this is our optimal spectrum of light right here in the green range. This brings me to say that each week in Canvas, I have added all these kinds of resources for further exploration, supplemental links for your consideration. Um, these are cool things that I've found, but that we just simply don't have time in our 50 minutes to get to. So it's your, your choice whether you explore these or not. So for instance, Mysteries of the Unseen World in week three would tell you more about the color spectrum that we just discussed discussed, how other animals do it and use their eyesight, so those animals that can see in ultraviolet or in infrared or both, having this incredible range of wavelength that they can see that we can't even relate to. So I hope that you explore some of these alternate things I've offered to you there. So digging in more to plants is that uh, I'd like you to do that on page 51 there in your journal. Some ways that you, you are different from plants. Considering when I refer to, refer to plants here, I'm talking about trees and herbs and bushes, grasses, ferns, mosses, green algae even. So take a moment, brainstorm your three on your page, and then talk with your neighbor three ways you're different than plants. shout out some differences. How are we different than plants? How are we different than plants? I can talk. Nice. Thank you. He can talk. We all can talk. We don't yeah. photosynthesize. We don't photosynthesize. We have free will. We, have free will. we can move. Cool. Feel emotion. We reproduce differently. Not as green. Not as green. All right, so now do this. Same on your page. Ways that you are the same or have similarities to plants.
so what do you have on this list? What do we have in common with plants? We both die. We both die. Yep. We need water. We need water. Hmm? We're both alive. We're both alive, yeah. Need sun. Need sun. How beautiful like a plant. Beautiful like a plant. Depending on environment. Yes. We both grow. We both grow. We have our own environments. We both benefit from each other. We benefit from each other. Cool. So we're going to dive into some of these. We're going to build on the similarities today because similarities help us to see um, how we are, you know, in relationship with each other. So we're going to start with, um, somebody said this, we need each other. We breathe, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. We mentioned this as one of the cycles. Breathing in, I receive earth, and breathing out, I give to earth. So what are we what are we giving and receiving? We've talked about this. So plants take in the carbon dioxide, combine it with water, use the sun's energy, and the chlorophyll makes this magic happen. Where sugars, this is the food for the plant, and then they give off this byproduct, which is what we need, the oxygen. So as we are breathing, the cells in our blood are grabbing up that oxygen all around our bodies while simultaneously picking up the used up air that has carbon dioxide, the waste product of our metabolism, and then we exhale. It's a beautiful relationship. So it's interesting to think about how I learned this in elementary school through high school and then again in college and how I didn't really make that connection that this is coming directly from you, from me, and this is going directly to me or to you. So this is photosynthesis, putting together with light a manufacturing process that happens in the cells of plants within the tiny bodies called plants. So it's pretty great, I mean, that we have this relationship. Um, it's essential. This is the essential process that makes up what is 95% of the mass in a tree. Uh, and then photosynthesis by trees and algae and all those other plants is what contributes nearly all of the oxygen that we breathe into the atmosphere. So one mature tree can make the oxygen needed for two people. And therefore the converse must be true. Two people make the CO2 needed for one mature tree. So this is how they eat, right? This is, those sugars are happening here, just like we need to have sugars and, you know, that we're taking into our bodies for energy. This is what powers the plant's growth. Um, we are all essentially in some way solar powered. We are not creating these sugars, but we are, everything that we do starts with energy from the sun. So that wavelength range that I showed you at the very beginning, the 400 to 700 nanometers, is exactly what plants need as well. That's the range of light that we see in, and that's the range of light that plants need to make the energy for their food. So that's pretty cool. Then we move on. We have a circulatory system, just like I said. We cycle all that oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out. Um, and trees also have this circulatory system. They have the xylem, which transports water and some nutrients all the way from the roots to the leaves and the shoots. And then the phloem transports the sugars made in the leaves to all over the trees. So it's very similar to the functions of our arteries and veins, moving this information or this, these products around to where they need to go to build more cells in the tree. So that we have in common. Plants have evolved. So when we look at this chart, um, starting down here with protists, the very beginning of life, and then evolving on up, there's some seaweed going on there, the earliest, and then we've got more plants as we move up until we get, you know, full-grown trees. Um, first, some 
older kinds of trees. The first big trees evolved about 360 million years ago, had roots and leaves. Those were the lycopods. And back then, 360 million years ago, lycopods you know, were 30 meters tall. But now lycopods, when we see them, are about six inches tall. It's in the group of mosses. As they have evolved, they need to have mossy, uh, wet, moist environments because they reproduce by spores. It's a very old type of reproduction. And then in this era, after that, came the innovation of the seeds. And seeds enabled plants to colonize the non-wet land. So now we have the forests that we know. So there's a total change then from the way that these trees and ferns reproduce to the, the big oaks and maples that we see here even around town. So those were about 250 to 65 million years ago, the time of the dinosaurs. It was the time when Pangaea broke into many fragments and mammals appeared, but they were not flourishing yet. Ferns dominated the landscape at that time and conifers. So times have changed, right? Plants carry this long history. And you can see that it all started here at the bottom with protists, where eventually up this chain is where we then also evolved. So 50 of the 500 family, families of flowering plants had already evolved about 66 million years ago. And mammals were then also becoming increasingly diverse. It's a long story, but we share about 60% of our DNA with bananas. We share 50% of our DNA with trees, 40% of our DNA with apples, 25% of our DNA with daffodils, compared with we share 44% with bees, 90% of our DNA with cats, and 84% of our DNA we share with dogs, and 98% of our DNA we share with pigs. So we have a lot in common starting from the very beginning. So we've all evolved, right? We've all changed. Other things we have in common, plants grow. Think of a plant and what comes to mind is that plant that maybe you envisioned at the beginning, your favorite, a favorite plant. Some leaves, roots, a stem or a trunk. But not all trees follow that formula. Some form are what we call this clonal grove. So what we're looking at here, all of the yellow trees in this image are one organism. They've just continued to pop up new stems from the original root base. Um, this is, a, it evolved just after the extinction of dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. This is in Utah. And pando is what it's called. It means I spread in Latin. Pando is among the largest and oldest organisms on Earth. 47,000 stems cover more than 100 acres. It's the heaviest known organism on the planet. So an individual trunk can only live 100 or 150 years, but obviously the whole grove itself, the organism itself, is much, much older than that, maybe like a million years old. So those estimates are based on how quickly the aspen spread. So just like plant, just like people, excuse me, just like people, plants have evolved different strategies of being successful in community, working together, growing and being. So then we're going to talk about this, the idea that plants communicate. The way that they do that through the air and under the ground. So we can share important messages of, gosh, I hear, you know, the flu season is really bad. It's better get your flu shot this year. But trees warn each other of what's going on around them as well. They can do this through chemicals that they send through the air. 
um, they're giving and receiving chemicals that they send out and then they can take those in and receive the message from their neighbors. So they can do it through chemicals in the air, but then it's a pretty recent discovery that they also do that underground. I'd like you to take in this video, Ben, when you have a moment. check out more of that video if you choose to um, or you can look up those the researchers that are working on this um, they are Peter Wollobin and Dr. Suzanne Samard uh, they are the ones that um, are doing most of this cutting-edge research and let's see if I can get this to work oh there we go Thanks. Um, back up. There we are. And there are their names if you want to check them out. So Michael Pollan is a food researcher, particularly, uh, and he says, to clarify some of what they said in this video, he says, I don't think plants are sentient. They're not conscious in the way that we are, but they do have agency. On their own time scale, they are reacting and they have intelligence. They deal with changes in their environment. They either adapt to it or change it. So you can check that out. So communication and then also plants depending on community. The wisdom of the mother tree Mother tree nurtures the younger trees, and that single mother tree can be connected to hundreds of other trees. They talk, they communicate, and through these conversations, they increase the resilience of the whole community. The forest is stronger when they have 
other trees around. And that's trees of all different species. That mother tree will give to her young, but she also gives resources to the other plants that live near her. Experimentation reveals that fungi actually move the carbon and the water and the nutrients between trees depending on their needs. So they have to be able to communicate what they need. At the hub of the forest mycorrhizal network stand these mother trees, as represented in this. The mother trees are these big, dark circles, and they are connected across the forest to all these smaller trees. One third of the food that a big tree makes may go to feed others around. So on our field trip in week 13, when we go to Shavers Creek, you'll get to see an old oak there, and she is dying. She's a beautiful example of a mother tree. But as she dies, she is sending more and more nutrients out to the community around her. A 2011 study in Philadelphia, researchers reported an average lifespan of 13 years for downtown street trees. So the ones that are really in downtown, in the city. And then the ones living on residential sites along streets are 37 years old on average. And then for the best city sites, which means maybe a community park where there are more trees, those trees are averaging about 60 years. And then a rural site, maybe more like where we live, maybe some of the, the places that you live, trees live on an average of 150 years. Those trees on the streets are lacking connection. They're lacking the support from their neighbors. They're also unable to give support to others, giving and receiving. And in recent studies, we have learned, and sometimes I wonder why we have to study things like this, neighborhoods that have more trees planted lower human mortality rates. People are living longer when they are living in community with trees. The association gets stronger as the trees get older. Older trees are better for our health. The scientific findings are that large trees have better air pollution absorption, they moderate temperatures, they reduce noise, which in urban areas, those three things are linked to higher death rates. And my deep sense is that trees bring us better emotional and social and psychological health too. In the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's the botanist Native American that we've talked about, she says in some native language, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. So I'd like you to take a minute and talk to your neighbor. What's coming up for you at this point? What's happening so far? out in a little bit. For now I'm going to continue though this idea how else are trees, what else do we have in common with trees? We'll move on to this. So all of these images you can see this red bud tree that's above the Nittany Lion here and the hemlock 
eastern hemlock cones and the dogwood tree and the apple buds. And this is one of my favorites, these little things that become the maple seeds, the sugar maples. So why do plants have these? Anybody know? These are for sex. This is tree and plant sex. They all exist because of this. So there is this, these parts of a flower, okay? um, and all of those things function as flowers to, to make this happen on these trees. This is gonna be happening here. I was counting down, it's like seven weeks away. We're gonna be having like tree sex all over the place. <laughs> So, it's pretty exciting. Um, so, we have those structures that then, you know, look like this. I'd like you to watch this video. It's a very short video. I know that it's a very old video, but it's still the best one I can find on this. And so, take in this, this tree sex video. And the pollen lands here. But it still isn't fertilization. The nucleus in the pollen still has to reach the nucleus in the egg down here. Now the pollen grows a long tube like a long straw which follows the nucleus to the egg. Seen under a microscope, these pollen grains are germinating. Pollen tubes are growing from the pollen grains. The male nucleus from the pollen passes down the tube on its way to the female egg cell where they will fuse and fertilization will be complete. So they reproduce differently, yep but there's still some cool stuff in common there. Uh, so that pollen, you know, as we walk around, you know, that, that when you come out, your windshield is covered in like the green stuff, that's the male sex cell of, of the plants, you know, when you need to go and wash your windshield. So essentially, this is spring fever, right? It's happening all around. It's happening for animals and it's happening for plants too. It's a time of opportunity. Spring is coming. It's a perfect day to think about this. So then, like us, other things that plants have babies, right? These are baby plants. And then those baby plants, you know, we think of them as seeds, or you might think of it as, as an apple. We don't often think of that as like a tree baby, but that's what it is. So how they get dispersed, just like us, we need to send our kids away from home to grow, and so do they. Wind transports them. These are the maple trees. Maple tree seeds are called samaras. So those are some maple trees. They get caught on the wind and spiral away from the mom so that then they're farther away. Their genetic material is over there, trying to move the genetic material away. So apples fall with gravity and then they get eaten. They might, if out in the wild, they get eaten by a rabbit or by a deer. They get eaten by something and often they eat the whole thing and then they hop or walk away and then poop out the seeds all the way over there. And so again, dispersing their babies away from home. Blue jays, this blue jay's gullet, if you can see it, it's full down here with acorns. Actually, blue jays plant more acorns than squirrels do. And then water is another dispersal. Alder seeds, alder tree seeds can stay in water for a year with no side effects. They float downstream, they get caught on a bank someplace down there, and then they grow. So genetic strength and variation for the species makes everything stronger. And they die, somebody mentioned this. This is a nurse log underneath here. This is a long tree that died. And look at all of this growth that's happening on top. They give their nutrients away as they are dying and then even more so as they decay. So in quick summary, 
Plants breathe, they're made up of the same elements as us. They eat, they have a circulatory system, they've evolved, they grow. They use the same light wavelengths. They share resources, they communicate. They have sex and babies, they disperse their young into the world. They die and return to Earth. Lots of things that we have in common. So for some of us, this might be a process of learning and unlearning and relearning. So going back to high school, what kinds of things are you doing or did you do then that you don't do now? Right? We are constantly in this process of changing and unlearning things. The most obvious benefit of unlearning is recognizing and stopping stifling mindsets that we've had before. Those things that we hold maybe even unintentionally when we know, well, this is how I've always done it kind of syndrome. The ability to rid ourselves of old ideas that are no longer relevant. So take a moment and break this down, maybe in, in the world of how this relates to you know, what you've learned about trees today, uh, maybe an aha moment there, or maybe just in general. Talk to your neighbor about this. Anything you'd like to uh, add, say in the microphone? I was talking to our other lovely TA, Maddie, and I was curious, and I was wondering if plants also get horny. I don't know if they feel, I mean, they're creating that, all of that energy, right? All of what they did over the course of last summer was to, to store up all this cool energy because right now they don't have leaves, right? So they need to be able to produce all of those sex cells from, from energy that they stored back in the summer. So if that means that they've waited that many months to do that, who knows? I don't know. I've never heard it described, but I bet there's a feeling of needing to do it. Let's say it that way. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Any more out there? Comments? All right. So understanding this, trees have given us our grasping hand. The grasping hands of primates are an adaptation to life in the trees. The common ancestors of all primates evolved this opposable thumb that helped them grasp branches. The grasping hand evolved and claws disappeared. And today most primates have flat fingernails and large fingertip pads which help us to hold on, help them to hold on. There's this complex relationship between humans and plants extending far back in our joint evolutionary history. And this legacy can be seen today as plants provide not only our nutrition, but fiber for creating things that we wear, things that we use, pharmaceuticals, energy for animals and plants around the globe. 
plant domestication and agriculture allowed human society to develop and our settlements became more complex because of how we related to plants. And as such, our modern cities and cultures rely in part on the stable and reliable distribution and production of food. So plants have shaped how we live, where we live, what we do. Plants are central to our well-being, not only as food, but also key components of our religions and our cultures and our medicines. And this can be seen in the beautiful curve of a fern. The tendrils inspire art. The idea, the fact that indigenous forest peoples collect plant materials from medicinal or religious practices. We don't just get nourishment from plants. They are central to our societies in so many ways. The Chipko movement, trees are our bodies. If you wish to cut down the trees, your chainsaws have to go through our bodies. We will live or die with our trees. Started in the 1970s, it was a nonviolent movement aimed at protection and conservation of trees and forests. The name of the Chipko movement originated from the word embrace, as the villagers used to hug the trees and protect them from the woodcutters. Chipko movement is based in the Gandhian philosophy of peaceful resistance to achieve goals. It was a strong uprising against those people who were destroying the natural resources and disturbing the ecological balance that these folks knew was vital to their survival. This is just one of many cultures that have revered trees, felt the connection with trees. A significant portion of the world's religions and cultures have origin stories around the tree of life or the world tree. So what happens then? What we are doing to the forests of the world is but a mere reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another. As deforestation has ramped up, Earth's climate has changed significantly. Warmer, more adverse climate conditions are creating more difficult growing conditions for forest ecosystems and all sorts of plants that people need. We must take care of our trees just like we take care of our own bodies. If we don't, they won't be around to help us in the many ways that they do. That was a quote from my dad. <laughs> I believe that we've significantly lost some of this connection. So what comes up for you when you see these images? You know, this is sometimes referred to as the tree hugging glass and maybe it's exactly right. So take a moment, take in those images and then talk to your neighbor for a moment. trees, after all we've been through, having been in relationship for so long and having so much in common, where are we now? Why does this connection seem strange? Or maybe it doesn't. I would love to hear from some of you. 
What are your thoughts on this? I have one over here. Great, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, so like three years ago a tree fell on my house. Oh. And I initially was like that damn tree like fell yeah. on my house. Yeah, it fell on me. And we had like a back porch and like that was destroyed and whatnot. So like that was terrible. Mm -hmm. But at the same time it like I saw it as an inconvenience, but at the same time it was kind of like karma because like my house is made of wood mm -hmm. so like and a tree had to like die for me to have a house so like why am I upset that a tree then fell on my house that was made of maybe their relative or something mm -hmm. and I think it's funny how like I feel like Americans see nature as an inconvenience a lot of times like mm. when trees fall in the road like oh no now I have to take a detour but like now that I'm thinking about trees is like living beings with like feelings and connections to the trees around them I feel kind of bad for them like when they fall on the road because I don't mm. think they wanted to do that just as yeah. much as I didn't want them to do that right interesting perspective I appreciate you saying that thank you what else y'all in the balcony have been quietly late quiet lately Anything going on up there for you today? I have one over here, too. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, hi, my name's Dan, and I, I think that it's really cool that, like, I've hugged a tree before, so I feel like it's cool that when you hug a tree, like, every tree is different, and, like, I, like I've been to, like, national parks, like, Sedona National Park, where, mm -hmm. like, I think that's where the biggest tree is, or I could be wrong, but, like, everyone just, like, goes and hugs it for the picture, but then it's also kind of cool that the tree, like, remembers who you are, I feel like. Mm, cool. Sequoia National Park, I think. Yes. I think that that's really lovely. Interesting statement. Thank you for sharing. Other thoughts out there? Well, today's a pretty good day. So, you know, if you're a tree climber by nature, I hope that you take today as an opportunity to do that. I'd like to leave you with this quote. No two trees are the same to Raven. Can you sit still just for one, one minute? No two trees are the same to Raven. Branches are the same to Wren. If what a tree does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are, and you must let it find you. I hope that you have a beautiful day.